Hello, I'm uh, Ari, your host at Episteme Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to scientists, entrepreneurs, and deep tech startups that will change our lives. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Daniela uh, Marino, co-founder of Cutist, uh, based in, uh, in Zurich, in Zurich Sud Sud Switzerland. Dr. Marino holds a master in biotechnology from the University of Milan. Then she joined the ETH, the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and then uh, the University in Zurich, where she followed her doctoral and postdoctoral post researches in stem cells and skin biology. Founded in 2017, in five years with her team, Dr. Marino has built Cutis, a revolutionary biotechnology and tech uh, um, company backed by more than 50 years of academic research and by 50 million euro, euros from private investors and public bodies. Nice to have you, Dr. Marino. How are you today? Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure to be here. Please call me Daniela or I feel so old. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. Thanks. Everything is good. It's lots of work as usual, but pleasure to be here. It's a great honor to have you because uh, you're part of the stem cell family. So I'm very happy to have you. <laughs> you're a great innovator. So it's very, really, really a great pleasure to have you today. And uh... Merci beaucoup. That's all I can say <laughs> in French. <laughs> So uh, this interview will be in two parts. We'll talk about the creation of QTs uh, because the story around uh, um, the idea and how you build the company from scratch is incredible. And I think the audience will love Thank it. Thank you. And then we'll talk about, of course, uh, more in deep about uh, QTs uh, business model. But mm -hmm. just to start, um, could you just uh, talk about uh, the younger you uh, when you were 80 years old and... Uh, <laughs> When you were ending your high school, uh, what was your vision and plan? And do you imagine to become a great uh, startup entrepreneur, uh, scientist? Actually, my young me starts uh, not with 18, but with seven, because that's when I told my dad that my future is uh, playing with cells. So I told him I wanted to be a researcher. That I changed my mind. I don't want to be a medical doctor anymore because I rather want to prevent troubles than treating troubles so um he was like okay she's out of her mind but when i turned 18 i actually did leave sicily that's where i come from to go to milano far away from my family to study biotechnology that was the first uh, the first time biotechnology was present in italy and it was only milano so i studied biotechnology and i i was uh, aiming at my life being behind the bench being a researcher uh, fascinated by uh, by uh, stem cell research since the very beginning. Of course, it was you know back then the hit you know the the dolly sheep and everything, all these these new things coming up. And I always pictured myself as a professor in my life. You know, my mother is a teacher. I have plenty of family in in the U.S. and I thought I'll move to U.S. become an MIT professor or Harvard professor. That was my my idea for my life, right? So I finished my studies in Milano. I came to Switzerland for my PhD, did a postdoc, and I wanted to continue further. You know, the idea was to really go and, and take a next step. You know, scientists are always switching lands and countries, so that was the plan. But um, when, during my postdoc time, um, indeed, everything changed, and I'm um, now an entrepreneur, <laughs> self-made entrepreneur. And I always like to say, I decided to turn to the dark side of business, but I, st I still keep my green sword, you know, in the, in the backpack. So I'm not a complete dark side. I'm still having my scientific brain up and running. <laughs> you, you programmed yourself to become a great uh, person uh, 10 years later or 20 years later. <laughs> yeah. Some guy. <laughs> um, could you now talk about uh, the idea uh, of Qtis and how it emerged, you know, and how you build uh, you know, the first moment? Because the story is very, very interesting. Yes, I mean, the story is actually uh, a, a strange story. And I think at one point I'm going to write a book about that because uh, it didn't happen. It was not planned at all to happen the way it happened. So uh, I joined uh, this lab at the university as a postdoc. And, uh, and as a postdoc, you're expected to bring financing to the the lab, you know, because you are a grown up researcher now. So uh, my professor comes and say, look, you want to write a grant? It's a huge one from the European Commission, 6 million euros. 
uh, let's go for it. And if you get the money, we can do translational medicine. We take the skin that we now transplant on rats and we bring it to people. I was like, oh, that's super cool. So we started writing this grant. It took about six months to write it because it's a gigantic collaborative grant. We had 12 partners all over Europe. I mean, we had to write study protocols, apply for IP, a gigantic work. And um, I put all myself into it. And I, that's exactly the moment when I realized I could do more than the classical bench work because I was able to coordinate, I was able to travel around to convince people to join. I was involved with the, talking to the surgeons, I was visiting a patient associations. You know, I realized that out of the box, I was actually, first of all, pretty good. And second, having lots of fun. So when we then finally got the money, uh, I took the coordination of this consortium. Uh, so I started uh, being like a hybrid creature, still doing my research work as a classical researcher, but 30% of my time was uh, project management and coordination of this big group of people. So when we finally reached the aim of the project, which was transplanting skin, bioengineered in the lab on a first child with a burn, uh, and we opened the wound dressing and we saw that it actually looked pretty amazing. Uh, I just decided that day, okay, I mean, we have to do something with this skin. We cannot just let it be an academic project. And by complete chance, the European Commission sent me an email and say, because of your success in the story, uh, we actually offer a program for business development in Sofia Antipolis, in France, <laughs> in summer, fully paid. I'm like, I'm gonna go. I had no idea what, about business whatsoever, but it was South France in, in, in summer at the beach, you know, like, I'm gonna go. And I go there with a small baby. My husband wanted to kill me because instead of being with them at the beach, I spent the whole time getting brainwashed about business modeling. And on the way back on a Sunday in the car, I tell my husband, on Monday, I'm gonna tell my boss I wanna build a startup. I think, I think I can do it. Mm. And he was completely crazy about it. He said, Are you, you don't even know anything about business. I'm like, I don't know. I wanna give it a try. And on Monday morning, I knocked at the door of my professor and that's how it started. Sorry, uh, your husband is also in science or is... Uh... He's a mechanical engineer. He has, has a completely different background. But, you know, I mean, he said, how? Oh, I mean, building a company? I mean, this is something you have no idea about. You know, I was like, okay, I'm going to give it a try. And on Monday, I did exactly that. I knocked at the door of my professor. I said, France was good. I'm going to build a company. And he started laughing at me like, what? <laughs> Completely out of the blue. But he kind of, out of this uh, crazy first response, he trusted me and gave me the chance to give it a try. And we started winning competitions after competition. And two years later, the company was created. So wow. uh, yeah, that's how it all started. <laughs> you know, life is crazy because I, I can't imagine if at the same moment, imagine you, you, you had an offer to do a postdoc, I don't know, somewhere, yeah, somewhere else. else. Yeah. What happened to this project? You know, what could, have, what could have happened to this project? You know, it could have been you know, abandoned into, into, yeah. into the, to the academic, academic and academic yeah, uh, yeah uh, limbus, because then most of the projects end like that. You, and you, you end your non-dilutive financing, nobody takes it up. So it, it's a publication and that's about it, right? I mean, that's also what happened to many other skin projects even, you know, they never went to the step we are because uh, maybe the people, uh, at the, they were not at the right time at the right place. I was just coincidentally at the right time at the right place. <laughs> so. I, I love the story of, uh, <laughs> of Critis because it's so, so inspiring. And, you know, it's like, it's like, a, it's like a movie, you know? You, you, yes. And, and don't think about circularity of events. We are now opening Kutis Innovation. Mm. Where? In Sofia Antipolis, where mm. everything started. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk about QT's business model, how the problem you target and um, uh, your met the metrics of the problem, etc. because now mm -hmm. we need to talk business. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So as you, as you have heard so far, everything stemmed out of university and this project was launched by a surgeon. So our product was designed by the end user. So the surgeon was, ask, was asking us to deliver them skin, which would be strong, resistant, which they could use without too much care, which they could staple, suture, glue, whatever they do in a burn surgery, which is almost like a butchery surgery. Because what they do now is that if you have your back burned, 
they take skin from your thighs or from your from your chest they stretch it up and then they apply it on the wound so they basically create new wounds on you where you didn't have it to try and rescue your original wounds from, with the burn and of course if the burn is small it's not a big issue but if you burn 20 30 40 50 percent of your body it becomes a challenge, a real medical challenge, not even an issue. It's a challenge because there is not enough space where to take the skin from. Mm -hmm. So your thighs or your buttocks or your scalp become the only available places. And those places are harvested and re-harvested multiple times. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, patients are complaining about the pain and the scars on the areas which were not injured to start. So you end up with massive scars, a lot of discomfort, disfiguration, the need for reconstructive surgeries over long times, especially if you're a child that grows in the meantime, because the scar will not grow with you. So the surgeon said, you need to do me a lot of skin from a small piece, that's your challenge, and you need to give me something which will give no scar. And that's where the project is, is basically focusing on. So we can produce skin using cells of the patient, which we extract from a stamp size piece of skin, which doesn't leave them any scars. It's painless almost. And then with these cells, we grow them and we use them again, doing bioengineering, creating skin grafts, which we transplant on the wounds, but we haven't taken any you know, any skin from any other part from the, I mean, apart from the small biopsy. And we do the skin graft because that's what they wanted, something super stable and, 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 and robust. So it's very thick. And because of the thickness, when you transplant it on the wound, there is no gap under to be filled by the, the fibrotic tissue. So what we see is minimal scar, uh, scarring uh, after transplantation, even after five years. And we have transplanted children five years and a half ago. So they have grown quite a lot in the meantime. And our product is, seems to be growing with them rather than contracting. That's what scars do. So we have this, this tremendous opportunity to actually help a lot of people and not just those which are burned today as an active patient, also those which had burns in the past and are suffering with contracting scars and painful scars. We can remove those now and replace them with the novel skin, our product, uh, or we can treat patients that go for a gender reassignment surgery or for a skin cancer removal or for a giant nevus removal. So because of the characteristics and biological characteristic of the graft being so thick and, and resistant, we can also apply it on elective cases, reconstructive cases, mm -hmm. which is the first time basically uh, this is happening. And there is basically a very interesting market to, to reach for us in this, in this respect. So just uh, to resume for the audience, maybe people who are not uh, used with the skin biology, if you burn a huge era and you let just the, the skin regenerate the, 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 the surface, it, the scar will, will invade everything. The scar is, is, a, is, a, is a full of um, collagen, strong collagen. It's, it's made like a, a strong leather, you know, so you cannot move your, your it's arm. It's like plastic, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's amazing what you do uh, and uh, very, very important. Uh, the cell you use, uh, do you do you do you do you do you, do you select the, 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 the cells or how, how do you do you explain? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have actually a very uh, let's say simple method of selection. So it's it's selection based on media. So we don't do any magnetic selection or flow flow cytometry selection. Uh, so we isolate cells from dermis and epidermis, which are the top and the low level of skin, and out of this selection of cells, um, only the stem cells uh, from the keratinocytes, which are the cells of the epidermis, and the stem cells of the fibroblasts, which are the main cell in the, in the dermis, will remain in culture, multiply, and be then my raw material for the for the skin. So it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a passive stem cell selection. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, how long does it does it take to exp to have the the, the the amount you need to to, to then to mix it with the with the hydrogen? Yes, yeah, so we basically, of course, every patient is different. You know, we don't know in advance uh, how much skin we need to produce for specific patients. We need to follow, we need to be very flexible, actually, when it comes to quantity. Um, we can produce as of today in between three to four weeks, uh, but uh, we have a couple of years to go to market and we will try to reach the three weeks sharps and stay a little bit below that. Uh, it's, it's all a matter of optimizing the process and the expansion phase of the cells. The quicker you can be with the expansion, the quicker you can be back on the patient, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, and the cell then are mixed with the hydrogen. It's a, it's a collagen hydrogen, collagen based hydrogen, right? Correct, correct. So the, the, the collagen is liquid, so we can easily mix it uh, with the dermal cells. And then we let it polymerize, we compress it, we let it grow. And then on top of that construct, we apply the keratinocyte. So we recreate the double layer of skin that uh, we started off with, yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the origin of the collagen? I mean, uh, in... it's bovine. It's a bovine hydrogel collagen. Yeah. And for the audience, the collagen is a very highly uh, uh, conserved protein. So there is it's, no... the, it's the most conserved. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have auto you have the cell of the passion uh, that uh, mix with the with the with the collagen matrix, uh, and there is no rejection, of course. So if you compare this to the method used now by surgeon. Um, it's the method used by the surgeon is the autologous sorry autologous graft mm -hmm. of of skin. It's it's a know how that surgeon teach to to each other. It's not there is no company that that bring them the technology. So it's a, it's a more know how. Mm -hmm. well, it's it's a technique you need to yeah. learn. I mean, it was invented by Professor Tiersch in Germany many 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 years ago. And it has basically not really changed in the in the in the recent days. Of course, there is other products on the market for burns and reconstructive, uh, which are trying to support the autografting. So you have, for example, you can apply fish skin uh, before the autografting to try and improve the scar quality. You can spray keratinocytes on the autograft to try and close the wounds faster. Uh, you can apply uh, polymers below the skin. You know, but this is all companies and projects and products which are positioned to be used in combination with autograft and where Kutis wants to be pioneer and new first on the market is to replace the autograft you should not be harvesting so much skin to to heal the wounds uh, because you create a huge amount of troubles for the patient by opening new areas of the body which are actually healthy yeah, you know you increase the chance of infection you increase the chance of chance of morbidity the scarring i mean it's it's, it's the it's, psychological uh... yeah it, it's terrible you know and also for small wounds i mean you have a lot of young people which actually refuse the autograph because they don't want yes, their but... tie to be you know to be damaged and that's an issue right and and i mean that's what i always say you know it's 2022 we're gonna fly to mars soon and we're still using a technique which was invented centuries ago you know it's, it's about time we bring something else uh, as, as, a, as an option to this yeah another very impressive point in your company is that you have uh, automatized um, a very important part of the process you know of course when uh, when we when you take when you took the um, when you take the, the biopsy and you expand the cell this is human made but at that after that point you can completely automatize uh, from that moment to the to the production of the of the skin, right? Actually, it's it's uh, the full process that we automated. Oh. So we receive the biopsy from the surgeon. Okay. We plug in the biopsy in the first machine that will isolate the cells fully automatically. We take the cells into a machine which will grow them fully automatically and then out of this machine the output is bags of cells which go into another machine called the Novocast which will take the cells and the hydrogel do the combination do the culture do the media change ready to go back to the surgeon so we have these three modules ready I mean in we have prototyped them they're not ready for clinical use but that's the next step wow. uh, in the in the process of course the less fun step it's more uh I will of course share on the blog post uh, the the video of yes your, that's great because they're yeah. amazing and I think uh, you, you you can you, you can only fall in love of cuties when you see all, <laughs> of, all of this innovation is is great yeah because you know I mean skin people tend to forget is our largest organ you know a human being of a regular age and size has almost two square meters of skin on their body one point seven as an average you know that's a lot of skin. And if you need to produce that in a fast way, robust way, quick way, cheap way, you cannot do that with people. You need to, to automate the system so that it's it's going to be you know, reproducible. So if you do skin with a machine in, in, in Nice, you can do that in Hong Kong and Boston. It will be the same product. But if you need to have a lot of manual steps, the you know the cop the process is long and it's it's a complex process so you need to have super highly educated people getting trained and retrained you will never scale up this you know you will and this is why Kutis is trying to 
to to uh, be different. We are not just doing skin for the sake of doing skin. We are doing skin in combination with machines because we want to really sell this stuff to everybody that needs it, not just a few hundreds in Europe. That's uh, that's the idea. It's amazing. Um, we talk about the the, the different uh, the different techniques, and of course, you are far far away from them, and you are completely revolutionizing uh, the, the 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 skin therapy. Uh, there is also, if you allow me to talk about maybe one of your competitors, uh, which is all already uh, listed on the NASDAQ, Vericell. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of what they are doing? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, Vericell is, uh, I think the officially was the first company uh, selling skin uh, planet-wise. Um, uh, they are selling keratinocyte sheets. Mm -hmm. So basically they are taking a biopsy from the patient just like we do but they only extract one cell type, only the keratinocytes, and they're grown on a mouse uh, cell layer, and they create sheets, which are extremely fragile, thin, and, and very uh, sensitive uh, to shear forces and, 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 and stress. And they also do not really improve scar quality because they're even thinner than the standard of care. So you have this gigantic gap between the depth of the wound and the thin thinness of the the thickness of the, of the grafts but this was the first revolution in the field right this was it's an epicell that's the name of the product where it's based on the revolutionary stem cell research done by Reynolds and green in the us first guys ever that managed to isolate keratinocyte stem cells and recreate skin so impressive work done in the 70s all the way up to today they're still selling epicell um, it was other times in the 90s when they launched the product, so they didn't do clinical trials, they did, uh, they received an, a humanitarian stamp from the FDA, so they're still basically selling uh, only to the super severe cases, it's not a real commercial product, if you, if you pass me the term, and um, it has rescued a lot of lives, that's for sure. Uh, what we now try to do in 2022 is to improve and that, that concept of sheets into grafts which are uh, resistant robust and remove the scar issue and can be staple suture apply you know our glue it's simple for surgeons to be used without this fragility issue which seems to be a big issue for the end users and i asked it about very self because i think for investors uh, and also an industrial partner who would like to commit with you they can see you know um, a comparison point because very self sure listed in the NASDAQ, so they can see the potential of cut of cuties mm -hmm. also become a great company, a big company. So it's not something, you know, uh, uh, there is all, already some some history in, in this. Some, some, some benchmarking, yes, yeah. uh, possibility, yes. Yeah. Uh, you have also improved uh, the cell expansion uh, with, with, a, with a K partnership with uh, uh, with Quantum, right? Uh, with that, Teruma, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Teruma, yes. And this their machine allow to, to, to expand the cell more to automatize not, not uh, the, the cell expansion but also to have more cells right yes i mean this is actually a tremendous uh, upgrade in the system because again we need to produce carpets of skin large areas so you need a lot of cells sometimes not always but sometimes right i mean sometimes you need less but uh, when you want to cover half of a body, you need to do a square meter of skin, you need billions of cells. And it's also technically difficult to culture all those cells at the same time, space-wise, you know? So you need to have tons and tons of bottles where you grow your cells in 2D. And the revolution of the Terumo is that it's all based on hollow fibers. So you have a tube which is full of hollow fibers and you can grow the cells adherent in the hollow fibers. And if you would unroll the hollow fiber, you have 2.1 square meter of surface. Oh. <laughs> so this is the revolution. They basically packed the, the, the surface into a tube and the, it, the machine is big as a mini fridge. You know? So it, this is really, I mean, apart from the, all the advantages of the automation, the self seeding, the self feeding, whatever, just this compression of space is just, a huge upgrade for us because uh, otherwise we need to have <laughs> hundreds of incubators you know to grow all the skin at Did once um do you allow me a stupid question <laughs> uh, no question is stupid Go what, what happens if uh, we use only the the hydrogel without cells on the on the burner skin what happened 
uh it depends what wound it is right if it's a second degree burn wound where you still have leaving dermis the hair follicles are still there full of stem cells when the wound is not too large so the cells from the neighboring uh, uh perimeter can crawl in the hydrogel uh this i mean the hydrogel could eventually support healing However, the scarring part will still be uh, not improved because when the cells move in and start secreting factors, that's a wound healing process where you actually have scarring collagen being produced and contract the wound. So uh, it, it's, it's actually uh, something which one could do, but only on small superficial wounds. Uh, if you need to replace large and, and deep wounds, you need to replace it with skin. You cannot just simply help the wound edges. You need to do a skin surgery. That's where we come in. So the the cell of the patient that uh, fix that um, are in the in the hydrogen matrix are very important to attract the the other cell uh, and to to colonize the, the the gel and to make good skin, right? They themselves create the first barrier. So we we have evidence, of course, also in animals and on the patients that our cells from the graft stratify and create a barrier. So we don't, we don't need cells to go in and create a barrier. So it's done. And the same is from the dermis. But of course, I mean, the tissue will then be integrated in the, in the body. So you will, of course, have cell migration in and out of, of the graft. That's, uh, that's what we want. We want the piece of skin that we transplant to feel as part of the rest of the body. Uh, but we provide the, the graft with cells in and on top. So it, it by itself, it serves the function of skin uh, at the beginning. We, yeah, we don't rely on migration. On great, great. So you, we, we have this full process of automatization. This is mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, and do you think that we can, uh, we can benefit from um, uh, economic, economy of scale uh, during the after the industrialization and you know the the, the diffusion of the technology, or uh, or is it something that is very you know a very uh, high price uh, technology? Uh, uh, what is your thought about? Uh... Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, this is high precision uh, personalized tissue therapy, so it it's almost impossible to have it cheap mm. or as cheap as the standard of care. I mean, this is a lot of work we do you know on a high level standard so uh of course the machines will drastically reduce the cost of of of, of production so if you reduce the cost of production you can lower the price and you can reach eventually countries which cannot afford the same price uh, as us or europe right because this would be uh, our dream right to really expand the technology through the machines to also those countries where actually you have more burns <laughs> because of the situation in, in very very di different reasons right um and of course what is also the problem usually in therapy like those is that you have a centralized hub where you produce and you gotta ship all over the pla place and these are expensive stuff to be shipped because they need to be controlled temperature wise humidity wise they have a short shelf life you need special careers and all this logistic chain is extremely expensive and complicated to run. Mm -hmm. So the machine's idea is that for once in a lifetime, we can actually decentralize mm -hmm. and we don't have to produce everything in Europe or Switzerland, but we can try to have specific hubs in different strategic parts of the world, close to the biggest birth centers. And we don't have to ship the, the, the skin over for three days with all the consequences that, that it means, right? So that's that's why we are visionary in that sense. We are really working already now during the clinical phase to try and make that happen. We are not going in, in the classical steps, you know, like, oh, okay, we wait to see whether it works. Then we think about the next step. We are trying to be ready for when it works to send it out. And, and this is... Uh, it's revolutionary, it's fun, but it's also extremely challenging <laughs> and uh, and costly, you know? I mean, it, it, it's what it is, but I don't see another way. I mean, either we do this right or we don't. I did not abandon my Harvard professorship for <laughs> for nothing, right? I mean... <laughs> it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing and, uh, and I totally align on, on your vision because it's uh, it's uh, it's what we, we need, you know? It's what the world need. We need to decentralize this kind of uh, um, high tech with high know-how uh, mm -hmm. and to, to allow 
every center and even uh, small hospitals not on not not just in poor country in, in, even in france you know in france we have uh, we have uh, specialized uh, uh, we have hospitals who, who have the know-how of, 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 of treating a patient with with big burns and we need to transfer patients from another hospital to, to this kind of centers yeah so if you can completely democratize for all the hospitals uh, in the future, that's that's that would be, of course, uh, the best the best conclusion of the story. Especially because if you want to treat smaller burns or less severe burns, the machines could be descaled to something smaller, and the idea would be that those machines could be directly at the hospital at yeah. point of care. You don't have to ship it even a kilometer away. It would be inside the hospital. And this is, I think, is the future of medicine. I mean, that's, that's, you cannot do precision personalized therapy in any sector. With the CAR-T, with all this IPS, you need to be close to the patients. I mean, you can't, you can't be pretending everything works from one side. Yeah. Great, fantastic. So now let's uh, talk about your three uh, uh, clinical yes. you're, you're conducting in parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could rapidly talk about all the steps from the uh, from the lab to the preclinical and how you you designed the the, the 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 trials because they are very interesting and fascinating. Sure. So our product is a a medicinal product. Uh, it's not a drug and it's not a medical device. So it follows the medicinal product directive of the EMA and the biologics directive of the FDA in the US. And it means that before getting a centralized market authorization, you need to complete your clinical validation, which means a phase one, phase two, and phase three trial uh, to show a, a safety first, efficacy second, and expanded efficacy in the third phase. And um, of course, to reach phase one, uh, which you can also call a first in human, uh, you need to have a solid preclinical package, which includes uh, studies on toxicology, on tumorigenicity, on genetic stability, on characterization of the cells. And this package is then uh, run on in vitro studies, so on cells in culture, and up to animals. And we did uh, small and large animals, uh, rodents and pigs and, and swines. And with this package, we approached the um, different countries, in this case, in our case, Italy, Holland, and Switzerland. And with this package, we asked them if this was sufficient to start the first in human uh, trial. So we did that. We obtained that that's okay from the authorities. And we treated the first 10 children in a phase one. We completed the phase one. And based on the data of the phase one about safety, we got the approval to continue to the phase two. And in the phase two, now we need to confirm safety and we need to prove efficacy. So every patient now in the phase two has receives our product, but also the standard of care in a randomized body location. So we will be able to check on the same person because this is personalized medicine. Every patient is a different story on at the same per person in a randomized body location, who does better? Is it the novel skin better or is it the standard of care better or how much better? And we're going to do that for three years and uh, post-surgery. And after that, this data will be used to move to the next stage, which is the phase three, where then the authorities will ask you to expand the population. So does it work only on those few people you recruited in phase two, or does it work more extensively? And that's what the next step is. And once you prove your, your validate, you validate your program on the phase three, the authorities eventually, hopefully, fingers crossed, will give you the authorization to sell the product on a large scale. So uh, you have three phase, uh, you have three clinical trials, one on children, one on adult, and, and for adult and children, but for uh, reconstructive uh, mm -hmm. surgery, uh, because of course uh, there are people who uh, who have been burned and then uh, they have uh, you know the, the big scar etc uh, but but also maybe tumor you know big tumor yeah, that, yeah. that that completely deform uh, the face or other part of the, the skin yeah, um yeah. and so now both three are oh, sorry the three the three trial are, are all in phase 2b right the burn, the burn trials, the kids and the adults are in phase 2B because burns are rare in Europe and US. So we are running a trial which eventually could give us the chance to uh, receive a condition of authorization for burns, um, and which is like a fast track program to market because of the rarity of the indication. Uh, while the reconstructive trial is a classical phase two because clearly reconstructive cases are not uh, a rare condition. Indeed, skin cancer is actually 
increasing like crazy. So uh, it's it's uh, there we need to follow the classical steps. Uh, let's say that's why we separated the burns and the reconstructive. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Very amazing. Um... What, what, something that attract my attention on your website that it, it, you can read that uh, anywhere um, in Europe or Switzerland, burn compassionate patient can benefit from uh, can benefit mm -hmm. from QT solution and be grafted uh, with the novo skin. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it work? Are these patients enrolled in 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 your clinical trial result, or they are counted apart? Uh, so we can treat uh, compassionate patients. Uh, we can, uh, if the patient, of course, uh, is uh, signing the informed consent, we can collect data and we will basically treat these compassionate patients as if they were clinical trial patients. So we are going to follow them up, do exactly the same evaluation of data, taking pictures, doing analysis, but officially they are not part of the study. So they are not counting as part of the study, but they will be uh, supportive data for that uh, for the authorization package. So the uh, EMA actually strongly encouraged us to include as many compassions as possible, because you may or may not know when you run a clinical trial, uh, the clinical trial is done in a way that follows certain criteria of, of, of uh, randomization, of inclusion, exclusion. You run a trial on real people, but on not real settings, you know, it's a bit artificial the way you se select or exclude patients. And the compassionate patients are the real case. Mm. You know, somebody who is in need of, of skin, we transplant as much as he needs. There is no control if we cannot have a control and we try just try to do the best to rescue somebody's life. And for us, this is first of all, incredibly rewarding that we can really help people surviving in, in severe cases. And it's an incredible test, stress test for our manufacturing because we need to do lots of skin in a short time. And it's incredible amount of data that we can collect because when you treat a patient like that, you can really make a difference in terms of quality of life and collect health economics data. Uh, did, did we save any cost in long term? Did we do things which you cannot really do in a trial where you're only transplanting a couple of pieces, you have a, you have a control and it's all super regulated. So honestly speaking, it's, it's a tremendous luxus we have to be able to treat compassionates. And you can imagine how rewarding that is for the team also that needs to work and can really touch you know, with their hands uh, the, the fact that we can try and help somebody for real. It's very heartbreaking when we see uh, children or even adults you know, completely burned. It's very, very, uh, I can imagine uh, the motivation that can bring for the yeah, exactly. to this kind of adventure. Yeah. Um, so if you have a compassionate uh, case from South America, uh, a hospital in South America who asking you to, to help them, uh, is it possible for you? I mean, for me, my question is about logistics. It's just to imagine if you can organize a commando team, you know, taking your machine and your, your team and taking the fly, the fly, a uh, special fly, you know, and going there. Mm -hmm. is, that, is it something possible or not yet? So as of today, we have uh, only treated patients uh, within uh, land reach. So driving distance, um, even, I mean, beyond uh, 20 hours driving, I mean, it's not a problem, but we, we drove only so far. So the team is now working on uh, stabilizing the process for flying. Um, so we have not yet flown the skin, but this is coming in the coming months. Uh, so yes, theoretically, if there is a patient in Brazil, uh, we could accept accept the treatment and fly the skin to Brazil uh, and, and treat the patient. Wow. As of today, we have done, I mean, countries in Europe, uh, but uh, it's part of the scale up process, right? To be able to fly the product. Knowing that, as I said before, this is not the future of my scale-up approach, right? But uh, as of today, with the manual process, I need to produce here, right? So that's that's what it is, yeah. Very exciting, very exciting. <laughs> um, so and what about, uh, let's say, your commercialization in the coming year? Um, uh, it's um, around 2024, right? Something like that? We need a couple of years. I mean, we have the chance to... Uh, uh, at least try to get the conditional authorization in two, two, three years. And if that option doesn't succeed, uh, we will go for the full authorization. So it would take another two to three years on top of that. So it's a long process, but we are 
pretty much well ahead on on, on you know on on, on the on the on the on the full line and uh, we see the end, the light at the end of the tunnel i mean it's going to take some more years but we get there i mean it's it's what it is right it's a medicinal product and we need to follow the rules i mean there is no no alternative to that do you already have uh, do you already have some idea about your marketing and sale model uh, will Putis uh, directly sell your solution to uh, hospitals or specialized hospital or do you target distributors or I mean, the, the, until we manufacture in-house and, and sell skin on demand, uh, we can't have a distributor. I mean, we are basically producing and selling uh, on demand. Um, and in Europe, uh, there is not that many, believe it or not, uh, large burn units. So we may handle the distribution ourselves. Of course, if we want to expand in different countries, we will probably need find a strategic partner to help us with all the logistics and all the manufacturing hurdles. Uh, we are not there yet, but uh, we also have to see uh, how the company will develop, right? Uh, we could grow to the point where we could actually handle uh, the key geographies uh, internally, uh, but at this point in time, no option is closed. So a large partnership will still be something uh, appreciated, of course, to speed up the process. Yeah. I will put my, my, my money on the table that um, you will... How much? How much? How much? <laughs> one thousand, one thousand. You will, you will democratize uh, the treatment of skin, skin uh, of skin burns to all the hospital. Uh, I the, hope so. The, mm. the, the big university hospital, but also the small ones, you know, who are far from the big city, etc. Yeah. I totally believe in that because what you have accomplished until now is amazing and oh, very big, uh, in the stem cell field. Uh, uh, and you know, I, I follow the the, the 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 market very closely, so it's really amazing what you have done. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about a little bit about you know the the finance uh, of duties. So uh, because investor, uh, it's not just my opinion. You know, investor believe in you and they followed you and they invest in you. So uh, let's summarize the fundraising rounds. This yeah. 2017 to now so QTIS uh, total fundraise is uh, 48 million Swiss franc uh, nearly mm -hmm. 50 million euros from mm -hmm. private investor and public bodies uh, after a seed round in 2017 uh, round A followed uh, in 2018 just one year after this is very this is show how the investor uh, are dynamic behind you and believe mm -hmm. in uh, the last private round was a Series B, uh, Series B with two, 20 million uh, Swiss francs. 27. Uh, yeah. uh, so make uh, for a total of uh, 27 million private funding. Am I right? Uh, I mean, altogether we raised 48 millions, of which uh, nine are from uh, European Commission and the Swiss Commission. So. The rest is from a lot of uh, interesting investors, which believe in the story, which believe in the in the in the dream of, uh, as you say, uh, revolutionizing skin surgery, and which understand the the challenges and the hurdles behind the story, but are really, really, really trying to help the best they can by opening doors, by investing, by helping, finding uh, people, partners, collaborators. I love my investor pool. It's an extremely rewarding community. I call it. It's it's a Swiss. It's a Scottish it's community which I'm building. It's not the classical way of fundraising uh, in a classical biotech where you have one or two VCs syndicating together. Uh, it didn't start like that. I was not chosen to be like that. But the project is so easy to understand in a way and so uh, uh, so people relate to it a lot you know people know people that got the burn they know about that scar they know about that and very soon we attracted a lot of, of, of interest from private individuals and family offices and you know family offices in Europe are growing and they are tremendously educated and they are a great resource for companies like mine absolutely. so i'm extremely happy about that yeah. and they are more and more committing in early stage absolutely of startups absolutely and they really know what they're doing i mean it's incredible how educated and and professional they're getting it's it's a, it's extremely extremely nice to watch the evolution could we see uh, the, the two major investors maybe uh, the the wise foundation we we say hello to them and <laughs> And I also read on open information about your fundraising that uh, there is a gentleman named Gianmaria Giuliani who, who yes. represents the family office also. 
Yes. So my lead investor in the round A and B was Gian Maria Giuliani from the GSA family office, which is basically the family office of the Giuliani family, which has uh, which is owning a Giuliani Pharma in Italy, and they specialize in skin care and hair care. So you know, very much uh, educated in that field. And of course, then the Vis Foundation from Hunter Vis in Boston, which uh, is also uh, strongly supporting us uh, for many years now, and many other names I cannot mention publicly, but uh, very good family offices in different parts of the world. We have a few few geographies involved in the story. So, um, if some VC specialized in medtech and biotech are, will listen to it, to this podcast. Uh, just to, to let them to understand the, the your last round, what was the purpose of your last round? Because you know all, you, there's always a, a project you know that should be put in face of a round. So what was the last round purpose? So basically, the, the round B, we raised the money for uh, completing the phase two and for completing the machines and uh, creating our new facility, manufacturing facility, because clearly, uh, Putis is betting a lot of in-house manufacturing. We are not outsourcing manufacturing. And that was a big challenge because we had to build the facility, validate it, and get it approved during a global pandemic, <laughs> which was not fun. So that was the, the basically the round. And actually now we do have an open round as an extension to that round to give a little acceleration and a push to the activities. Also because, as you may have read, we also did some nice moves uh, lately in terms of acquisitions and, and, and growth. So uh, if people want to get in touch with me for potential fund uh, investment opportunities, feel free to reach out to me. So you're, you're saying that you're open to a, to a new round? Correct. Great. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we have we have uh, talked about the, the, the finances. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can talk about the great news because I you know I, I have mm -hmm. one fit in Switzerland and one what one fit in in the southeast. I was very happy to read that Cutis has just uh, opened it, a research and development unit in Sofia Antipolis uh, called Cutis Innovation. Uh, so we'll, you will transfer, of course, um, know-how and technology in, into this unit. Plus, you will, re you will re also recruit a, a key professionals. Uh, you have also secured uh, an important grant from uh, the Région uh, Provence Alpes Côte d'Azur, three hundred thousand euros. euros. Mm -hmm. uh, congratulations, first, and, uh, <laughs> and what what will you do here? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for us, it's it's important to. Uh, catch all possible opportunities we, we encounter. So we didn't plan to open a subsidiary in France, but we, we got in contact with people. We realized it is a hub for dermatology. We started in, in you know, uh, 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 talking in interesting discussions with potential new collaborators, new partners, and we realized it's good to bring a food there. So we have a presence and we can really interact with the, with the, with the local uh, strategic partners. And uh, yeah, so, uh, and as I said at the beginning, Sofia Antipolis is, was the start. So we are now closing the circle. And uh, we already see that in the first months of activities, I mean, the amount of new opportunities is, is incredible. So it's always good to step out of your comfort zone. You know, everything has been Swiss, everything has been in Switzerland. And it's nice to start looking outside and, and you know, recruit new talents, have new partners. Uh, and and that's, that's what we think it's, a big advantage uh, of Kut is trying to really think beyond the classical moves. And um, you may think it's a crazy move. You're still a startup raising money. Why are you doing that? I think it's going to be a success. So we really count in this new company now. Yeah. Of course, and France have um, uh, have several uh, center of uh, skin treatment for exactly for brands. It's, it's, close to them, and it's, 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 it's obvious that you should be you should you must be here. Um, yeah, we are. So yeah, it's all good. Great. <laughs> Great, great, great. And also, I I don't know if it's linked or it was only uh, a coincidence. Coincidence, coincidence. coincidence. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> you also signed a partnership with um, IBSA Pharma, which is a very important pharma uh, uh, that commercialized the VT cell technology. And it's very important because uh, um, both for the skin burn, you know, because when you have when you are treated you you, you will lose your your skin pigmentation mm -hmm. uh, but also for vitiligo uh, i know uh, i know vitiligo because my father was was affected by vitiligo okay. uh, he got 
couldn't go to the sun so yeah it's not um, fun <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and also this, all the social you know the the social yeah yeah sure the implications social wise yeah can you talk about this this partnership and how how it is sure. yeah so basically you know we knew since day zero that we will have to pro provide a solution for pigmentation restoration in our patients because the novel skin as i mentioned is composed of two cell types and the third one, the melanocytes, which are the cells which produce melanin are not present. And uh, without those cells, you just simply cannot recolor. So we were starting working on a way to implement melanocytes into the graft, inject them after the graft. We were looking into single, different, different solutions, but of course, everything is based on cell therapy. We are a cell therapy company. We are stem cell people. So uh, we are not looking into tattoos or you know pigment injections or whatever. Uh, and, and, and whatever you touch upon a new cell therapy based uh, product, again, you're in front of you years of clinical validation and, and whatsoever, right? So we, when we saw the VT cell, a CE mark product already on the market for treating vitiligo using stem cells of the patient from uh, a colored part of the body to recolor a, a discolored lesion, we thought this was a tremendous opportunity to cut short time to give our patients as of today a possibility to recolor their skin. And of course, uh, there is plenty of others with the vitiligo, as you mentioned, your father had, um, which have nothing to do with burns. So we have the chance to also help all those patients which are uh, simply having discoloration on their skin because of this disease. So for us, it's a great fit with what we do. It's cell isolation from one side, application on the other side, personalized skin cell therapy. We can use it on the novel skin. I mean, it's just a perfect match. And uh, it's in Nice as well. So <laughs> it's now we are a big family over there. And yeah. the, the technology perfectly. Um, it's a perfect match. To, to your automatization. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a solution ready to go as of today. Of course, Kutis is an innovative company. We opened the Kutis Innovation now in France. We will for sure improve the product and work on it for generation number two and three. But as of today, what counts is that we have something that can be used. And we don't have to tell our patients, you got to wait five or six years until you're allowed to do anything. You know, that's what counts. Uh, because patients still are the center of our our universe you know you can do all innovation you want but they have to wait and sometimes you know if you can cut the story short for them for their sake uh, everybody is happy yeah absolutely fantastic this 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 uh this story this uh mm -hmm. the story of Curtis is, is is really like a like a you know like like a movie <laughs> Great. <laughs> we'll see one day. <laughs> you promised me also a bonus for the for ending the, the interview about uh, something uh, very exciting uh, announcement. Yes, yes. I mean, there is also a little twist in the story because, of course, uh, the machines were developed uh, from us, by us, from scratch, from ideas. The father of the machines is our chief innovation officer, Vincent Warford, by the way, a French American guy. Uh, which had this dream of the machines for many years because he has been in the skin business for many years. And when he built the machines or designed the machines, he said, look, let's think beyond skin. Already now at the design stage, if we can do skin, can we do cornea? Can we do mucosa? Can we do muscle? Can we do gums, you know, for dental applications? It's at the end, it sells grown and patched and rejected or retransplanted. And this is why we believe that if everything goes well and Kutis will build the muscle to grow to such a dimension, uh, we could transform those machines into a platform. And we could actually deliver those platforms to hospitals, which don't do burns, but do other treatments, even dental uh, clinics where you need to uh, regenerate gums, you know, in, in, in patients which really today have almost no solution. Um, and if we do that, it almost sounds, sounds like science fiction, you know, a machine that can produce different organs and uh, you can fix the, the these bodies, which we want to keep now living longer, but that need some, some changing parts to make sure we can live longer <laughs> because we are not meant to live that long as we do. <laughs> so you need to replace piece by piece from time to time <laughs> to, to keep functioning. So... That's that's the dream we have, you know, to build this platform and uh, and to really revolutionize the way regenerative medicine is handled in at the clinical side. Yeah, Cutis is really fantastic company, very promising, and um, I don't have the word. You know, it's so so great. 
it's like, it's like I, I was waiting to see something like that uh, coming on earth, you know, when I was a PhD student in stem cells. Believe me or not, I, I, um, when I was a PhD uh, uh, doing stem cells research, I, I told to my, to, my, to my supervisor, damn, we, we stop, stop it. This cell culture doesn't bring you anywhere. We, sh we, should, we, should, we should produce tissue and organs. You know, and then they laugh at me and they, uh, they told me, okay, uh, Go back to your cell culture. Go back to your cell culture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So that, let's see. Let's see where, how far does this take, does this take us and uh, how close is the future? Because, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's what we work on, to try and accelerate future and, 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 and be as fast as possible into the next, uh, to the next skin surgery or regenerative medicine uh, era. Huh? Let's, uh, let's see. It Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> conclude, could you maybe uh, say some words to PhD student or postdoc who would like to, to follow your path? Uh, uh, something is... Just be, just be bold. Uh, think about what you want. Try to keep the line and don't be shy. Don't be scared when people tell you, ah, oh, that's difficult. Uh, you're not going to raise money. Uh, it's going to be tough. Uh, nobody succeeded so far. Why would you... You know what? Just give it a try. Follow your gut. And worst case, you lose. You open another company. I mean, it's like, you know, you need to give it a try to innovate. If you don't do mistakes, it means you're not innovating enough. And uh, look into TED Talks, read crazy books, you know, follow the crazy innovators. You can be pro and con, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk, but if people made something, maybe, you know, and, and just, just try to be brave enough and, and think big. That's, that's what helps you keep dreaming. Otherwise, it's, uh, yeah. Things are not moving at the same speed they should. I resume. Be brave, be bold, and big, and think big, and think big. Yes. Great. And be a little bit crazy. A little yeah. bit crazy. From time <laughs> to time. Yeah, that doesn't doesn't harm. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody enjoyed. And uh, I'm available on plus social media or on the website. Yeah. I will share every every link and, and also the, the key video of your of your of your perfect. Conference. Thank you very much and see you see you soon. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye.